morning. If you have your Bibles, would you be turning to Romans and chapter 11, please? Romans chapter 11. Before we jump into the word this morning, I just want to tell you, I, I got a good report from my doctor this week. My PSA count, which tells you where your cancer level is, was at 18 to 19 before I had surgery. And two weeks ago, I had blood tests, and uh, Mary and I went to see the surgeon this Thursday. And he said, you're, I got good news. Your PSA count is now less than 0.01%. So I thank the Lord for that. And thank you again so much for all of your prayers. Thank you for a lot of you that came and gave us cards and so on yesterday, celebrating mine and Mary's birthday. Mine was late, and hers is still to come. But uh, celebrating 70 years of age and still only feeling 50, so we feel pretty good. All right, Romans chapter 11. And we're going to continue last Sunday's message where we're looking at, is God through with the Jew? And this will be part two. So, is God through with the Jew? Part two. Chapter 11, beginning in verse 11. And it brings us back almost to that first verse where Paul says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. It says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If I by any means... If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity. But towards you, goodness. If you continue in the goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Father, thank you for your precious word. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing. I, I thank you that I personally have received from studying it this week. And I pray that you would make it a blessing to your people that have gathered at this place today to sing your praises, to remember you, Lord, at this communion table, and now to give attention to the word of God. Lord, help us to feed upon your word, to be strengthened by it, to be informed by it, to be changed by it. Lord, we, we come before you with multitudes of needs here this morning. Father, I pray for... Lily and, and for Susan and their family, God, as they mourn the loss of one that was loved by them, Father, uh, we thank you 
that their daughter and sister Anne knew Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. That's such an encouragement. And we pray, Father, that you be with their family there in, in Kenya and give strength and blessing to them today as well in the sense of your presence. Father, I, I want to pray this morning for Gordon Saunders, our brother. He's uh, not been well. He's at home. We pray that you'd minister grace to his heart today and strengthen him and be with his family during these days. Thank you for being there on Tuesday, Lord, to help us to remember my Aunt Minnie, but also, Lord, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the family. Would you help them now as they continue to mourn her loss and give your strength to them? Father, we think of Barry and Chip as Barry battles cancer, Lord, as they they miss their son, and, and Lord, just haven't had contact with him for months now, we pray that you might... Lord, touch his heart to reach out to them, and, and Lord, just even let them know what's going on in his life. Father, uh, just this morning, looking over my prayer list, and it just seems to grow. We think of Everett Green there in the hospital, and his wife Sylvia. Would you give them comfort and strength and bring healing? We think of Bev and Andrew Dillon today, and the, both of them battling uh, health problems, and pray, Father, they might sense your strength and be encouraged in their hearts. For Allison Keys and John McBain and others, thank you that, Lord, they're seeing your hand at work in their lives, giving strength. May they continue to be encouraged by you and your word. Lord, I, I think of uh, uh, Jane Bida that was mentioned here this morning by Richard and uh, returning for a time to Ukraine. We pray for safety and travel, safety while she's there in that country. Lord, we lift up the Ukrainian people and pray for their protection. We pray, God, that you'd bless in this children's camp and that you'd help them to find a safe place, a, 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 a shelter, Lord, where they can go to find safety and yet be taught the things of God. We pray particularly today, too, for her uh, uncle who's in the military. He's an unbeliever. That, God, you'd work in his heart, Lord, uh, as the bombs drop and the bullets fly, to realize he needs a relationship with you draws heart to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If possible, Lord, even that she might even have a, a, a chance to talk with him personally, if that's, if that's possible. So we lay this family before you and their great needs. I think of the uh, a family out here, Lord, that's been living in a truck in our parking lot, that, Lord, you just have your hand upon them and that you provide the finances so they can get into a home, an apartment, whatever, Lord, to meet this need in their lives. And uh, we lay them at your throne today. And Lord, now I pray, as we come back to your word, oh, Father, help me to use this time wisely. I pray, God, that you'd speak mightily to hearts. Lord, help me not to speak here today in the flesh, but in the spirit of God. And give your spirit's blessing, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever sat and just wondered just wondered why are things the way they are in the world in which we live? There's a lot of things you can think about, aren't there? Why is it the way that it is? Why do we see, this is the one thing I want you to think about that most of us don't, why do we see in our day Gentiles evangelizing the world instead of the Jew? Are Jews evangelizing the world today? Not really. Not really. Not even to their own, quote, faith. They're not evangelizing out into the world. Why is it that we are? You look back over history from the beginning of the Old Testament on into the New Testament, uh, uh, up until the beginning of the New Testament, the only true God religion, if you will, in the world was Judaism. God came to Abraham and called out a people for himself and, and wanted to use them to be a people for himself, but also to go out and to reach the nations of the world. God said, through Abraham shall all the nations of the world be blessed. Israel promptly pretty much forgot that, as they forgot most of what God tried to teach them. But they were 
that one group of people that were holding out the name of the true creator God who created the heavens and the earth, all that's above and all that's beneath and everything that there is, making known to the world that there was an omniscient God who knows all things. There was an, uh, an omnipotent God who had all power. There was an omnipresent God that wasn't just a God over this little group of people, but he was what? He was available to the whole world. He's the God of the world. The major emphasis for the Jews was themselves. There were a few Jewish people that reached out to make what they came to call the Jewish proselytes, Gentiles that would come and profess faith in Christ. Now that was the way it was then, but the major emphasis in our time, in our generation, if you will, the last 2,000 years, is that what God is doing among not the Jewish people, but the Gentile peoples of the world. Particularly when we speak of spiritual things. God's working to grow his what? His church. The people of God today. God says, I'm calling out a peculiar people unto myself in the book of Titus. We are his peculiar people. That's his emphasis. Why is that? Why is that? Why are we the ones making the one true God known to the world? Why are we sending out missionaries from our church? Why do we pray for them in our own personal devotion times, but particularly here on Wednesday night, lifting them up before the throne of grace? Why are we sending missionaries practically to every nation on this earth? And where we can't go, we're sending the message by literature, by radio, by internet, all kinds of means getting the gospel to the ends of the earth. Up until that point in history, where God's son came into this world, lived a sinless life, was rejected by the Jew, lifted up on a cross and crucified, buried, and then you remember gloriously on that third day, the resurrection took place, and then a few days later, the ascension, where he went back to heaven. Everything to that point had been about the Jewish people, and now Israel is over kind of on the sidelines, set apart, set aside for a time. And God has chosen to go and work in this world through the Gentiles to reach the Gentile nations of the world. We don't need to sit and wonder why that's happened. Because God had told his people Israel almost all through the Old Testament, if you turn from me, if you reject me, I will raise up the Gentile nations. I will turn to the Gentile peoples. We've been learning that through Romans 9, 10, and 11. And it's sort of like God's talking about Israel, and all of a sudden he sort of just in the middle of the paragraph puts in a little parenthesis there which is the church, and begins to deal with the church. It's like he inserted us into his plan and purposes. But I want you to understand this morning is that we've always been part of God's plan and purpose. He didn't plan that it would just be Israel that knew God. They were raised up to be a missionary nation, which they failed to do. And so God, in order to reach the nations of the world, raised up his church among the Gentile nations when Israel rejected his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we look at those verses from uh, Romans chapter 11 and following, Paul says here, and I know some of you that maybe have read ahead in the book of Romans or you're real familiar with this book, you're thinking, Pastor, why don't you just skip this stuff in Romans chapter 11? You said enough about it last week. Why don't we just skip ahead and get to the important stuff there that gets back to talking about the church and what it's responsible for in chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. What's the reason that Paul put this here? Why do we have chapter 11? Why do we have 36 verses? Now listen carefully. Because the Holy Spirit of God 
Am I right? Moved upon the person of the Apostle Paul and had him put this here because he thought it was important enough that it be recorded in his word so we could study what? All of it. Not what we think is important, but all of his word. Because it is all important. So Romans chapter 11 The first 10 verses that we studied were important. These verses here are important. And that's why I've decided to stay right where God has put us and work through this chapter. Led of the Spirit knows that you and I need as a foundation to what God wants us to do to understand what's taken place here in the Scriptures. We need to realize that God has a plan for this world. We need to realize that it wasn't that God got caught by surprise and and I can't believe this. Israel isn't following me anymore. That didn't surprise God at all. I can't believe that they rejected my son when he hung on that cross. Didn't take God by surprise. Understand it was all part of God's plan. It was even part of God's plan that Israel would reject his son so that God could do what? Raise up the Gentiles and raise up the church to spread the gospel to the world. That may not make a lot of sense to you, but God had a plan. It was formed in eternity past. There's nothing going on in the world today that wasn't part of that plan that God didn't plan. And for, and know how to use in our lives, there's been a plan to turn to the Gentiles. Over the history of the world, the Jews hated the Gentiles, didn't they? One of the problems that we faced in our generation is that sadly, very often, the church has hated the Jew. Right or wrong? It's right. Sadly. One of those Christians that's You know, was a wonderful, godly man. But there was a time when this man by the name of C.S. Lewis made a lot of statements. I haven't got time to read them all, but just I'm going to just pick one of them out here. It says, "How can people be attracted to anything to do with the Hebrews?" He was anti-Semitic. He hated the Jews. Now, as time went on, he kind of turned that a little bit and and begin to realize that they were our seniors and, you know, we're sort of the, 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 the babies that have come along to follow God and, and, and after that, and that God did use the Jews and that he did, uh, you know, begin to do this through the descendants of Abraham and had a little more respect for them. Unfortunately, that's not always been so. How many of you have heard of a guy by the name of Martin Luther? Not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, church father that when the church had fallen so far, he was used along with a handful of others to revive the gospel, if you will, right? And the the preaching of the faith that we believe in today. And the thing with Martin Luther is that initially he was very sympathetic to the Jews. But after a number of years and many attempts to reach out to the Jews to evangelize them and having no success whatsoever... Martin Luther changed his opinion. He wrote, Our fools, the popes, the bishops, the sophists, the monks, those coarse blockheads. He was gentle in his language, wasn't he? Those coarse blockheads dealt with the Jews in such a manner that any Christian would have preferred to be a Jew. They were so good to them that most Christians wanted to be a Jew because they get treated better. Indeed, had I been a Jew and had I been... Such, uh, has seen such idiots and dunderheads expound Christianity, I should rather have become a hog than a Christian. I would advise and beg everybody to deal kindly with the Jews and to instruct them in the scriptures. In such a case, we would expect them to come over to us. So we, at the first, he didn't like his, quote, fellow Christians, the popes and so on, but he had some good opinions about the Jews, said we ought to be trying to reach them. However, in later years, the article I was reading here says, after no success in Jewish evangelism, Luther reversed himself 
and wrote a series of anti-Semitic pamphlets, one that was entitled Concerning the Jews and Their Lives. He admonished Christians. Now you listen what he admonished Christians to do to destroy Jewish homes and synagogues with fire. He said, and cover them with dirt. Silence the rabbis on the pain of death. He promoted the seizure of Jewish wealth and the enslavement of young Jews to hard labor. And he said, and may we all be free from the insufferable, devilish burden of the Jews. Now, I'm making a point of this because I'm seeing across the nation of Canada and the world a growing anti-Semitism where a Jewish girl can be beat in one of our high schools and try to cover it up. And I'm telling you, as God's people, we ought to love the Jew. We ought to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We ought to be longing to be able to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ and praying for their eyes to be open to God's truth. One Christian responding to the anti-Semitism in the world, he said, how odd of God to choose the Jews, but not so odd as those who choose the Jewish God and hate the Jew. There's a sense in which we, well, we've chosen the Jewish God, but so often Christians speak despairingly of the Jewish people. And God calls us to love them. We're going to see some of the further reasons of that as we get into this today. Hitler came along and Hitler in the early days of gaining support and they tell me he was a gifted orator. I have listened to him. He doesn't impress me much but, but uh, he could move the masses with a speaking ability. We do know that. And he would make it a point to slip in anti-Semitic comments in his speeches. And he often told the people that when he was speaking to them, if you make me your leader the first thing I'll do when I come to power is my purpose will be to exterminate the Jewish race. And he tried that. He attempted it. And he failed. He was making one of these harangues early on before he became the leader that we know of. And there was an elderly white-haired man sitting there in the audience. And as Hitler went on about how he was going to exterminate the Jew, this elderly man began to laugh. <laughs> he laughed at him. Afterwards, Hitler insisted that a couple of his people grab that man and bring him into a room where Hitler was. And he said to Hitler, might I ask you why, or Hitler asked him rather, the old, the old man, why were you laughing? The old man said, well, why were you standing up there talking about how you're going to exterminate the Jews, I was sitting there thinking about very many years ago, there was a person who tried to exterminate the race, but he failed. And he says, now every year, he was talking about Pharaoh and Egypt, he said, now every year, we celebrate the man's overthrow by eating our Passover feast. He said, and then many years after that, there was another man that tried to exterminate the Jewish race. You remember the story of Esther and Haman. He said, and now we celebrate that man's failure and overthrow by eating cake at the Feast of Purim. And he said, I sat there and I couldn't help but think, I wonder what kind of food we're going to eat to celebrate it when you're overthrown. <laughs> I don't know how the story doesn't tell me how Hitler took that, but I can suspect it wasn't real good. But I kind of chuckled when I read the story. And I don't know what food they eat to celebrate that. What we learned last week, and what I want to emphasize again, is that God has not forsaken the Jewish people. They're still very much in his heart. You know, the good thing was that even while we were pagans living in our sin and no desire to know God, we were then in God's heart too. The only reason we're here today is because we were, and we are, in the heart of God. And the Jew is still in God's heart. All of the troubles, 
all the trials that the Jewish people and all the terrible things that have been done to them, the Holocaust, the history of Jewish people is truly a remarkable story. And part of that remarkable story is that God has so marvelously preserved them. I don't think you and I can really appreciate the miracle of a nation that really, after 70 AD, wasn't a nation. Until 1948, 2,000 years later, God raises them up because what? All the way along, he'd been preserving them. No other nation has it gone, disappeared for 2,000 years and suddenly it's there again. I told you that last week. But here's Israel, still a force in the world in which we live. God predicted what would happen to them if they turned away from him and forsook him. He said, I'll stop the rains, I'll do this, you're going to disappear as a nation. And they did. But what's amazing, in spite of what Satan, because he was trying to wipe them out, and in spite of what the other nations of the world were trying to do, trying to wipe out and exterminate the Jews, they still exist today. The amazing thing, in spite of their own rebellion, in spite of their unbelief and the resistance of the will of God and the rejection of the Son of God that came into this world to be their Savior, it's an amazing thing, isn't it, when you stop and think about it? You have to wonder about this, that God still loves his people. He still loves and cares about the Jew. He did not give up on them. We saw last week those statements there in those first ten verses where he said that Israel, the people of God, have been blinded because of their unbelief. They've been hardened in their hearts. They've been calloused in their souls. They've been given a spirit of stupor, just like somebody had drugged them. They walk around in a stupor, to the, so they're stupefied when it comes to the things of God. They're insensible to the truths of the Lord and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what's amazing with this amazing God of us is that he can take something that's so terrible as the setting aside of the Jew. And turn it around to be our blessing. To bring the gospel to us. To the Gentiles. And we be raised up to be the missionary nation of the world. Last time we talked about Paul's inquiry as God threw with the Jew. We talked about Paul's insistence. Certainly not. We talked about his illustrations. Look, if God's through with the Jew, how do you explain me, Paul says? I'm a Jew, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and I'm saved. He used the illustration of Elijah that I won't get into this morning to say God's what? He's always had his remnant. He's not through with the Jew. And this whole thing that I've just gone over here is at the heart of the rest of this chapter 11. Did Israel's failure to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ Doom them, then, now, and forever, to separation from God. Paul's answer to that, chapter 11, verse 1, is what? Certainly not. Chapter 11, verse 11, certainly not. Not going to happen. It's an insistence there that God's not through with the Jew. It's not fatal. It's not final. It's not permanent. But a temporary setting aside, it's, it was a partial setting aside of Israel. It doesn't mean that no Israelites can be saved today. Not a total rejection of Israel. Even Jews today, if they would turn to Christ, have their eyes open and trust him. And we're going to see this morning that it's not futile. What God has done to the Jew is not intended to be futile. It's not without a purpose. I've already mentioned the first purpose. What's God's purpose in doing what he did to the Jew? What's... What's God done that's positive, that's beneficial out of that? Number one, the Gentile nations of the world are being reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ like never before. God's gospel came to us, a pagan people that wanted nothing to do with God and had, as in India, a million other gods. Some of them horrible gods. Most of them horrible gods. 
all of them horrible gods in comparison to Christ. But what I want you to see today and rejoice in is that God had a positive purpose of bringing that gospel to us. The reason you're seated here today, the reason that many of you know that your sins are forgiven, that you're a child of God and you have a home reserved in heaven for you, is because of God's rejection of the Jew and his turning to you and I. That today we can be saved. Today we can be born again by the Spirit of God. From their rejection came the opportunity for us, all of us, to get in on God's plan of grace and mercy and forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. He came unto his own, and his own what? They received him not. But most people don't bother with the rest of that verse. It says this, but as many as did receive him, to them he gave the power to what? To become the sons of God. What are you today, Christian friend? You're a what? You're a son of God. You're a son of God. You're a child of God, a daughter of God today if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in the days of the Old Testament, if you were a Gentile and you wanted to come to this God, there was a big, long process that you had to go through just to become a Jewish proselyte, to study and all these things that you did. And then you had to come to meet that God. You, you had to come to the temple three times a year. <laughs> and then you were still held off at a distance from God. You could come to the court of the Gentiles, but boy, you couldn't be like the Jews. It wasn't the same at all for you. You were held at arm's distance from God. I am so thankful that when I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I was granted instant what? Access to God to come to the throne of grace anytime I wished, with any burden that I wished to come to Him. Is that a blessing to you? I'd be so thankful that if I was Jane and I was going back to Ukraine. But at any moment there, flying in an airplane down on the ground in Ukraine, she's got what? The throne of grace. To turn to and call upon the God of grace at that place. God's offer was extended to us. We don't have to go through that difficult process. On the day of Pentecost, Paul, or Peter rather, stood and preached the gospel. And what? Multitudes came to Christ and found access to Christ at that moment through the wonderful words of God. They didn't have to stay out in the court of the Gentiles. They could kneel in a house or out in a field and be in the presence of the living God. And all they had to do, Spencer emphasized this in the communion, all they had to do was what? Believe in their heart and receive the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of their sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and he was available to them. We who were what? Ephesians 2.1, dead in our trespasses and sins. A dead man can't do anything to save himself. We couldn't do anything to save ourselves. The Bible says in Romans <clears throat> chapter 5 that when we were still what? Yet without strength. Oh, praise God. Christ died for the, for what kind of people? Ungodly people. Ungodly people. The problem with the Jew is that they never saw themselves as ungodly. And so they didn't see any need to put their trust in Jesus Christ. Thank God he did something for us ungodly people. And when the Jews rejected Christ, it opened the door for him to introduce us to that wonderful, glorious gospel. You should take your Bible sometime today. I don't have time. I saw the clock back there. And read Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 9, and then verses 11 through 13. And then ask yourself this question. Is that really true? For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of your what? of yourselves not of works lest any man should boast you're not ever going to go to heaven 
You don't have to worry about, did I put enough money in the offering plate? Did I, did I read my Bible enough? Did I pray enough to do this? Listen, you ought to pray. You ought to give to the church. You ought to do all those things. But listen, you're not going to heaven because of that. You're going to heaven because of the grace of God in sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. No other reason. You thank God when you come to that table. And what it represents in his body being given for us, his blood being poured out for us so that we could have everlasting life. Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12 says this, And I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom, who's that? That's Israel will be cast out into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What was Jesus saying? He's saying that people will be allowed to come to God, but the sons of Israel who have rejected the Messiah will not receive him. All Christ rejectors will be cast out. There's a price to pay for rejecting Jesus. Israel's paying that price today. Listen, if you reject Jesus, you will pay a price. You risk being cast out forever and for eternity from the presence of the living God. But God says, thankfully, today is the day of salvation. Put your faith in Christ. Walk with him. God goes on to illustrate that by telling a parable in the scriptures of a, 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 a feast, a wedding feast that was prepared. And he went to the, the family and people and that, you know, invited them to the wedding and they said, oh, we're busy. We can't, couldn't be bothered with that. And then he said, go out into the what? The highways and the byways and the hedges and compel them to come in. We're in that period today. Let's go out into the highways and the byways and let's compel them to come in. Let's go across the nations of this world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that they might be come in and be a people of God. Let's thank God. That when Israel was rejected, it has a positive result of what? You and I having the opportunity to be saved in Christ Jesus. One of the things that flowed out of all of that was Acts chapter 13, where the church had come to Antioch and Pisidia, and Paul and Barnabas were there and, and a lot of others, and they were teaching the people and raising them up, and then the, they got the idea, you know what, through the Spirit of God, that maybe you ought to choose Paul and Barnabas and send them out as missionaries to the world. And they went out. They went out. In Acts chapter 13, verse 46, Paul talks to the people there and he says, he says, Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken unto you first. You go back in Romans, and we already studied this. It says to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. Paul says, it was necessary that it should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it, and judge, listen to this, and judge yourselves. God didn't judge Israel. They what? They judged themselves. Because God already told them what would happen. You've judged yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Verse 47, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have sent you as a light to the Gentiles. Paul says, I am the missionary to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have sent you as a light to the Gentiles. That you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. I want salvation to go everywhere. It's every tribe, nation, tongue of people. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word was being spread throughout all the region. You want to know what the Jews' response to this was? Verse 50, and the Jews raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas. They just didn't listen. They continued to persecute. We're Christians today. Because God desired it and God determined it. But in one way, because of the rejection of Israel, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it came to the Jew first, and they missed out on it. 
I think what's wonderful is that God didn't let their rejection thwart his purpose or his plans. He never let it result in that, never allowed it to happen. And so he's extended the gift of God, which is salvation, and the Jews rejected it, to the Gentile nations of the world. I want to tell you, God had a threefold purpose in mind when he did this, when he set aside Israel. One was to win the Gentiles to Christ. Try to demonstrate that. I've left out a lot of verses here, but, but that's what he was trying to do. He said, I, I want to win the Gentiles through that. But then Paul's going to tell us this. God had a second purpose in turning to the Gentiles. He said, my desire here is that we, we through the church and the joy that it experiences in the Lord and the change in their lives might provoke the Jews to jealousy. When they see what God's doing to us, that Paul says, I'm hoping, the Spirit of God was hoping that the Jews will wake up and say, you know what, we missed out when we rejected the Messiah. Look what God is doing to those Gentile peoples now that they've come to Christ as their Savior. Provoke them to jealousy. <laughs> you might call it evangelism by jealousy. Now, I said that as I wrote that down, and I said to myself, does that sound right? Evangelism by jealousy? But I want to encourage you, practice evangelism by jealousy. That you so raise your children, and men, you so love your wives, and wives, you so treat your husbands, that the lost people of the world, not just the Jewish people of the world, but the lost people that are your neighbors and friends and relatives, will see something in your life that makes them say, I wish I had that. Shouldn't it? That's evangelism by jealousy. Let's make them jealous of what they see. The joy that we have in the Lord. Listen, when they come in here and sit in a service, let's sing so that they know they're not singing because of ritual. They're not singing because they have to do it. We're singing because we want to sing to God. The joy of the Lord expressed from our hearts and our lives unto the Lord. Covetousness and envy and jealousy, not always wrong. If God says, I want to promote, provoke the Jews to jealousy. I want to make them envious of what you have. You see, it's not wrong if, if the thing that you covet, the thing that you envy, the thing that you're jealous of in itself isn't evil. If it doesn't deny the other person having it, if you take it. Right? You know, if you've got a car and I envy it and I steal it on you, that's wrong. But listen, if I'm saved and you're jealous of having that gospel and I give it to you, I don't lose it myself, do I? No, I'm still saved and you get to benefit from that. And God wants the Jews to be jealous of what we have in Christ. He wants them to covet it. He wants them to desire it, to have a hunger in their hearts for this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a right desire. And that gospel came to us, and what happened? Evangelism happened. Souls began to be saved. 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. Shortly after, another 5,000 came to Christ. Revivals broke out. Missionary journeys began. Acts chapter 13. Churches were established. The joy of the Lord filled the Gentiles. And Paul thought, just maybe, just maybe, this will provoke jealousy among the Jews. And among a few it did. But sadly, very few were brought to Christ. He's hoping, I, I'm hoping they'll rethink the rejection of Christ. I hope that they'll see something in you that is so satisfying and wonderful that they'll come to Christ. Uh, some of you have probably heard of a, 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 a Dr. Charles Feinberg. Now, he was a brilliant man. Charles Swindoll says that, that he sat under his teaching and he was so intelligent that he could sit and be writing a note to his assistant while continuing to speak and teach the lesson that he was teaching to the class. Just a brilliant man. And, and he was a Jew. And he was a non-believing Jew. And his mother brought in a, a young woman. He, he grew up. Uh, 
in the United States. And they had a, a servant in their household that was known as a Sabbath Gentile. <laughs> she agreed to keep the Sabbath and some of the rules and so on and rituals that they had in order to have a job of working in their home. And she was paid for all that. What they didn't know was that the reason she was willing to do that is because she was a Christian and she wanted to come into that home and have a chance to share the gospel with them. And Charles Feinberg says about this woman that, that she'd taken some of the rights, Hebrew rights of purification and so on. I know some would criticize her for that. But he said he began to be attracted by the quality of this believer's life and he began to ask questions. And when she couldn't give him all the answers, she took him to a Dr. John Solomon. He was then the resident head of the American Board of Missions to the Jews in the United States. And Dr. Feinberg was led to Christ in his own words because he had been made thirsty. Let's make this world hunger and thirst for Christ. By what they see in our own lives, let them be jealous of what they see going on and how God has blessed us and what he's doing in us. Christians ought to be so alive, so full of Christ, so full of the love of Christ. Listen, for one another, right? If all they see is us sitting around grumbling and complaining and criticizing one another, what's there to draw them to Christ in that? They can get better things by joining some club somewhere. We ought to need to see this in our lives. And there's, there's an amazing statement. I'm just going to jump down here to verse 15 of chapter 11. He talked about them being cast away. And he says there, for if they're being cast away is the reconciling of the world. That's what we're talking about, right? The reconciling of the world. Gentiles coming to Christ. He says, what will their acceptance be? Back in verse 12, at the end of that verse, he says, what will their fullness be? What will their acceptance be? But listen to this, life from the dead. Life. Fullness of life will be theirs. God has not cast away the Jew with finality or fatalness. The door still open for the Jew to come to Christ. There's a day of fullness that's coming for Israel. Casting away, that was for our benefit. That was for our blessing. We've enjoyed that. It was wonderful. But there is coming a time when God's returning to the Jew. And they will come to Christ. They will find what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you quickly the when, the why, and the how. I'll give you the scriptures. Not even going to read them. Don't have time. How is God going to get it done? When's he going to get it done? Why is God going to do this? Well, verse 25 tells us God's going to do it in his time, in the fullness of time. He's going to bring Israel to himself. Not our time, but his time. In verse 26, he says he's going to do it through his son. God's going to make the deliverer known to Israel. The deliverer is who? It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You can study this through for yourself. In verse 27, he says God's going to do it according to his word. It's always been part of his plan. He's going to, use, he's going to talk about the covenant of God that he made with Abraham. God's going to fulfill that. His covenant means God's word. In verse 30, he says he's going to do it by his mercy. He's going to do it by the grace of God and the mercy of God. Not because Israel deserves it. Not because they're so good that he's going to turn back to them, but because God says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And listen, God's so powerful that nobody's going to stop him from doing it. Just want you to understand that. In verses 33 through 36, we'll get to in another week or so, he says God's going to do all this for his glory. God got glory from taking the gospel to Abraham and the Jews. He got glory when he turned from them and turned to the church. He's going to get glory when he turns back to Israel in the fullness of time. If I had time, I'd go to Romans in chapter 5 and verses 8 through 10, where Paul says something very much like this. He says, if a dead Savior can redeem us, right? A dead Savior shedding his blood can redeem us. Imagine what a living Savior can do.
Not just for the Jew, by the way, but for who? For us. Do we have a living Savior? What can he do for us? Listen, he can deliver us from sinful habits. He can deliver us from this sin nature so that we can display the life of Christ. Amen? We're not stuck where we are. Don't stop using all those excuses about, well, yeah, but you don't understand, you know. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but you, you don't understand what my wife's like, and so that's why I do this. No, listen, Jesus Christ can give you victory. Jesus Christ can lead you in triumph if you turn your life over to him. Jesus did this to win the Jew or win the Gentiles. He's done it hopefully with the hopes of winning the Jews in the fullness of time. Listen, when is the fullness of time? It's going to be partially during the tribulation period that we talked about last week, that seven-year period when God's going to raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists or 144,000 Pauls to reach the world during that time of horrible trouble on the earth. But listen, the fullness is what the Bible calls the millennial kingdom. Where for a thousand years, Jesus Christ is what? Descending to this earth, first on the Mount of Olives, defeat the nations of the world that have risen up against God and his people. And then Jesus Christ sits as what? As king. In his kingdom, ruling and reigning on planet earth in all of his fullness. And he'll rule and reign for a thousand years. And he says, they will see me in Zechariah, whom they have pierced. And they will turn to him. And they will come to the fountain that is filled with blood. The blood of Jesus. And be brought to faith and salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, Israel began as a theocracy with God as their king. They turned from that one to human king and so on. And kept moving away from God. Went into idolatry and all of that. But Isaiah 11 verse 9 says this, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Is, is that true in Israel today? Nope. But he said, The day is coming, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters that cover the sea. Ponder that for a moment. Is Israel filled? Is the world filled with the knowledge of God today? What's it filled with? Every kind of excruciating filth. Pornography. Immorality. Alcohol and drugs. And abortion. And euthanasia. And all these things. So anti-God. The world's full of it today. That spirit of antichrist is at work in the world trying to raise up an antichrist and to put us all in submission to that antichrist. We better determine right now we're going to live for one Christ and that's Jesus Christ and him alone and give ourselves over to him. Zechariah 12, 10 says, and I will pour on the house of David, that's Israel, on, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications, then they will look on me whom they pierce. Spirit of grace that's been poured out on his church is coming to Israel. Zechariah 13, 1, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David, for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Listen, what's the fountain for? For sin and for uncleanness. The same way it saved us from sin and cleansed us from our unrighteousness is going to work for Israel. Zechariah 14, 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day it shall be the Lord is one, and his name is one, and Jerusalem shall be, listen, Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. That's almost hard to comprehend, isn't it, in the world in which we live. But God says that day's coming, Jesus is going to sit on the throne, and they will accept Christ, and it will be the difference from being dead to what? To life. The power of God, the glory of God. Now, I had some lessons I wanted to leave you this morning. It's 10 after. I'm going to have to leave those out. But uh, I may come back and start next week with them. I don't know yet. But I want to tell you this. Christ is a glorious Savior. He's a mighty God. And just as he hasn't forsaken Israel and will not forsake Israel, 
the good news you grabbed this morning, he will not forsake you. Turn your life over to him. Become his child. Admit your sin. The Bible puts it this way, all. So none of us can escape. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He says, abandon your efforts to save yourself, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy and grace in Christ Jesus. Put your faith in what he has done. Acknowledge what Jesus Christ did for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you suffered on that cross. You endured my hell on that cross so, so I could be what? Forgiven and cleansed and made righteous before God in Christ. As many as received him, as many as believed on him, to get him gives you the power to be what? To become the sons of God. To be saved and born again by the power of God. Are you? Are you saved today? If you get in that car and on the way home, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying it could happen. You might not be back here next Sunday. Would you be saved? Would death for you mean what it meant for my Aunt Minnie? <laughs> Absent from the body and present with the Lord. I told the folks at the funeral the other day, the casket sitting up here, I said, I want you to look around. I want you to tell me, as you look around, who's the most dead in this place? Everybody's looking at the casket. I said, I want you to know it's not Minnie Mun. <laughs> she's more alive than she's ever been. I said, she never died. Jesus said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall what? Never die. Her body died. Her spirit and soul rose up to be with Jesus in heaven for eternity with him. Would that happen to you if you died this week? You need to know. And we're not going to have a closing song today. That's all right. Just because of the length of time. But I'm going to slip down here. As people go out, if, if you want to talk to somebody about Christ... You can come to me, you can go to Pastor Richard, you can go to somebody else in church who knows a fine believer, Dr. Bob, Gary, whoever. But listen, don't leave today without knowing. My soul is saved and sure and held in the arms of God. Your sins are forgiven. Heaven's going to be your home for eternity. Father, thank you for the patience of these people and letting me preach to them today. I know much of what they've heard, they've probably heard before. But I pray, God, it would stir up their hearts. Lord, give us a love for the Jew. Help us, Lord, not to get caught up in the anti-Semitic spirit of our day. But most of all, Lord, help us to make certain that we've responded ourselves. That we'll not be like Israel who rejected the Son of God, but we will respond and receive him as Lord and Savior of our lives. Lord, I pray that there would be those that are seated here today that would begin to experience that life-giving power to change and transform their lives and fill them with joy that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Give them the courage to approach some other Christian today. And Lord, make sure that their faith is firmly founded in Christ as Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.